My morning grew quiet as my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new and life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner. My shame was arrested. Thank you. I'm going to let you be seated for just a moment. I'll stand you back up in just a little bit. But uh, right now, for those of you with aches and pains, sit down. There you go. We're so glad you're here today. We have a lot of uh, guests with us, and we want you to know how much we appreciate you joining with us in worship today. And thank you so much for being here. We have, we have folks from all over the place as far as Michigan. These folks over here came from Michigan just to be with us today. And uh, we have... There you go. We have people that came all the way from Raleigh because lunch is being served somewhere, but they're going to be here. <laughs> We're glad all of you are here. Well, because of the resurrection, everything opened up for us. Did you ever think about that? You know, when, when Jesus died on the cross, the, the veil was ripped in two. We have access to the Holy of Holies. But when that stone rolled away... And the claims of Christ were proven true. Guess what? We have complete access. And so part of our, our worship here at Myrtle Grove is that we love to pray. 
Now, I'm going to say, I, I have heard through the years people say, prayer is such hard work. Have you ever heard that? Give me a witness. Like, prayer is such a hard work. And do you know why it's hard work for some people? Because they don't want to do it. I mean, dishes is hard. <laughs> because I don't want to do them. Yeah. Prayer should be one of our favorite things to do. And you know why? All you have to do is, in your mind, think and pray. You can pray out loud. You can pray anywhere. Years ago, when they were talking about uh, getting prayer out of the public schools, Ronald Reagan says, as long as they're test, children will pray. <laughs> and I'm telling you today that some of you are going through test. And let prayer be your first resort, not your last. Today we're praying for Kendall and Missy Lewis. Their son is the missing swimmer off of Emerald Isle Beach. Would you pray for Kendall and Missy Lewis? This is Fletcher's cousin. And then um, little Elijah was born this past week. He is in NICU um, and feeding tube with rash and tremors. This is Ken and Patricia Murphy's grandson, Laura's baby. And so would you pray for this baby? He is in Myrtle Beach. Lauren's baby. He's in Grand Strand Hospital. Thank you so much. All right. And then pray for Sue Mitchell. She's just diagnosed with throat and lung cancer. She is in hospice and only has a few days left. And then there was a young lady who came to me, and, and uh, I was trying to remember if it was this morning at sunrise service or if it was on Good Friday service. But someone introduced her to me, and she has throat cancer and I apologize, I cannot remember her name, but we prayed over her at that point, asking the Lord for healing. Do you have a request? Do you have something on your heart? Then begin to ask the Lord, Lord, what can I do? I can start to pray. Betty, Betty Francis, would you pray for Betty Francis as well? God bless you all. There's a lot of more requests here at this church. Altars are always open. You say, aren't you stuffy Baptist? Not when it comes to the altar. You can get unstuffed <laughs> right down there. Let's all stand. God, our Father, we worship you today on this Easter. We pray with great expectation and anticipation of what you're going to do. We love you so much, Lord. You died on the cross. You paid our sin debt. But you didn't stay in the grave. That wouldn't have worked. You showed death and the grave who was boss. You rule over sin in our lives. Lord, you say if we'll accept your claims that we have everlasting life and life here that is worth living. So we come with praise on our hearts today for the empty tomb. We pray for all of these, especially that baby and that family who is missing a son and the ones who are sick and the ones that have um, throat cancer like Mary Francis. And Lord, we ask you today that you would give us the ability to see beyond this veil of tears on this day and to see eternal life because of Jesus Christ worship you in the name of the one who gave his life for us and who arose from the dead so that we might have victory over it all as well. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in his name and all God's people said, amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in 
seated. Oh Lord, today we praise you for your finished work on Calvary. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. He was saying that it's finished in the past. It is finished in the present and it will remain finished in the future. Jesus did not say I am finished. That would imply that he died defeated and exhausted. Instead, he cried out. It is finished. Tetelestai meaning I have successfully completed the work I came to do. These words were our Savior's final cry of victory. When he died, he left no unfinished business behind. When he said it is finished, Jesus spoke the truth.
all God's people said, amen, amen, it is done, it is done. Wow, I, was, I had all these remarks I wanted to make, but y'all are so pretty today, I just about forgot what I was wanting to say. Just turn to your neighbor and say, oh, you're so handsome, you're so handsome, yeah. As long as I can remember, some of you. As long as I can remember, I have loved reading and hearing stories. How many of you like, like me love a good storyteller? Do you like a good story? I love a good storyteller. I love words that are in stories that describe people and places, and, and, and I just love stories. I look for stories all the time, and I repeat, if you tell me a story about yourself and you don't want it told, you need to say, please don't repeat this. Because I will repeat your story. I will. I will. I, I, I have repeated Debbie and Darwin's story so many times over the past 27 years. And, and uh, Deb was going through a cancer treatment. I talked to her in, in uh, Duke Hospital. And, and Debbie and Dor- Darwin decided to get married. And God miraculously healed. I love to tell that story. Would you give the Lord a hand? But I tell you, getting back to descriptive words in the stories, uh, when you hear a descriptive word in a story, the story comes alive, doesn't it? Like crashing thunder. I mean, boy, you can just hear that. And here's one I like, doe-eyed darling. Doe-eyed darling. Some of you go, what's that? Well, if you've ever been that close to a deer, you would understand that. But uh, There's a word in the English language that some of you guys say, we don't hunt. And I'm okay, forget that. There's a word in the English language that many of us in the spirit that love sports. And by the way, just let me see. How many of you like football? Let me just check and see. How many of you like baseball? How many of you like soccer? How many of you like golf? Let's stop right there. <laughs> how, okay. How about how many of you like basketball? All right. So those are the only sports I know about. But here anyway, <laughs> the the sports stories that I've heard this past week, a lot of them, the the commentators painted some really great stories with some really descriptive words. And one of the story, one of the words I heard over and over this past week was the word redemption. Redemption. Now, let me explain my sports connection. Tiger Woods won the Masters. It's been a while since he won anything. In fact, he, uh, a few years ago, most of you, how many of you will say, yeah, we thought he was pretty much done. He self-destructed. Remember, his mugshot showed up on the news. Uh, his wife left. Um, he had physical injury after physical injury. And we just looked at Tiger Woods and like, mm, stick a pen in him. He's done, isn't it? Most of us just wrote him off like a bad debt that could never be collected. And then, last week, Palm Sunday... The tiger roar was heard again in Augusta. And you know what the commentator said? They painted the picture, and you know what they painted it with? That word, redemption. They said, this is redemption for Tiger Woods, and the news of Tiger's redemption spread like wildfire. Even my wife, who does not know an eagle from a birdie and might think a putter is a slow-walking old man, even (laughs) Mary Jane said, hey, did you hear Tiger won the Masters? And I'm thinking to myself, does she even know what the Masters is? <laughs> the news across the world, she really does. The news across the world had a picture of an iconic golfer donning a green jacket again for the fifth time. Uh, Phil, would you stand up right there? This is my object lesson. There it is. <laughs> All right. And everyone said when Tiger donned that green jacket, Redemption. And there was a tiger roar for the books. Well, let's talk about that word redemption. What does that word actually mean? Redemption is an action. It is a doing. It implies a need for an action. Redemption always points to a negative that was overcome. Redemption is the act where somebody is saved from some error or sin or evil. And it is to be saved or set on a new course. It is the idea of a second chance, a new beginning. Now, when we talk about Tiger Woods, we know that, well, that's a great story of redemption because, boy, did he have some errors. Um, He didn't live live a bogey-free life, did he? No, he didn't. But, you know, while Tiger's story is such a good story, if you're a child of God, did you know your story of redemption is far greater than Tiger's? You say, where did my story begin? Because, you know, today's churches, we don't use a lot of churchy words anymore. You know, we're afraid that our people are not smart enough to hold on to them. Redemption is a good word. 
And your story is all about redemption. So your Bibles are open to John's Gospel, chapter 20. It'll be on the screen as John reports the resurrection. Now here's what the Bible says. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. And so they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. On this Easter Sunday... Your story begins right here. This is your redemption story. It did not start with you. Your redemption story started with the God-man, Jesus Christ. Your story of redemption started as an amazing victory like no other. Your story is about an amazing success. Now, I don't play golf. I hear the Masters is a great course, the granddaddy of them all. And if you win there, you're considered elite and you still have a place in sports history. But the Masters in Augusta, Georgia, is not the hardest victory to win. Now, whipping death, that's a good one, isn't it? That's a huge win. Unlocking the grave, that's extreme. How did Jesus do all of that? We we live in in an era of uh, sports figures who talk smack. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They, They say stuff like, you can't come into my house and disrespect me. We're going to whoop you if you come in here. Talk spack, right? They do. We're going to whoop you because we're unbeatable. Now, I know it sounds familiar because all of you heard smack talk. In fact, some of your kids smack talk to you. And you need to smack talk to them. <laughs> See how politically correct I am. Now, Jesus Christ didn't talk smack, but he sure made some claims, didn't he? You see, the claims of Christ were authenticated by an empty tomb. Every time you hear somebody make a claim, you want to know if they're good for the claim, don't you? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, let's see. You made a claim. Are you going to back it up? Here's what Jesus claimed to be. He claimed to be God. John 10, 30, I and the Father of one are one. Jesus claimed that he would die and rise again. Matthew 17, when they gathered together in Galilee, Jesus said, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. Jesus claimed he had the power to give resurrection to us as well. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Jesus asked? In other words, here's Jesus making claims. And when he rose again on the third day, his resurrection proves he was up to the challenge to prove his claims. If you say, I can beat death, and then you stay in the grave, not much to your claim is there. But Jesus' claims can be trusted. That's where your story begins. Have you trusted his claims? If you have, you have a story of redemption. Now, let me say this. I can talk about golf. I can talk about working on cars and a host of other things. Uh, I can talk about uh, mechanicking, you know. And I've got several of the guys who work on my vehicles here today. And they know that when I come into them, that all I'm doing is talking. In other words, I cannot do a brake job on a car, can I, Mike? He's here somewhere. I I can't, uh, you know, it's all I can do to put antifreeze in a car. But the issue is, I can talk about it, and I can talk about any other talent. But the proof of all that 
is in doing it. I don't play golf, but the proof of golf is playing the game. Can I get a witness? Not many in here can play. <laughs> the proof of mechanic in is actually fixing a car. Can I get a witness? You and I can talk about Christianity and the proof of trusting Christ's claims on our lives and have to say we have a clear profession of faith. But unless it's actually working in your life, then you haven't trusted the claims of Christ. I have a saying that I use with my children. They'll come. In fact, I used it with my oldest child this week. He's going through a rough stretch. And, and uh, I said, Shannon, let me just say, remember what, what I've always told you. If your theology doesn't work all the time, you need to find a new theology. You see, your story can start today. If you have not yet fully trusted and accepted the claims of Christ personally, your theology may be that, that God is just a guy up there that you call on when you need him, and, and uh, otherwise he needs to stay up there and you need to stay down here. And whatever your idea about God is, if your theology doesn't work all the time, and I'm going to tell you something, when you accept the claims of Christ, your theology will always work. And your story begins in an empty tomb. And then your story continues. Your story of redemption is all about living in the power that you've been given. Remember, redemption is all about being saved from something old to something new, to a new beginning. And that's where your story really gets interesting, isn't it? You see, God saves you in the empty grave of Jesus, assures and guarantees and confirms the fact that claim that God has on you for eternal life. And so life before redemption, it was all about trying to deal with life. And some of you are trying to deal with where you are in life right now and the crises that life brings. When Jesus arose, he revealed everything you need now and everything you'll need forever. Now, safe to say, on Friday, when we celebrated Good Friday, we realized that Jesus was on the cross. That was his crisis, wasn't it? But the crisis of the cross was overwhelmed by his power and his authority. Have you ever had a life crisis of someone close to you dying? Have you ever wished that you had the power to reverse that death? To breathe new life into a lifeless body of someone you love? I certainly have. I have wanted so many times to be able to go over. And, and I've been in many, many rooms where people had gone on to be with the Lord. And I just wanted to go over and say, hey, wake up. Come with me. Come with me. Let's go outside. You know, and I'm just no good at that. I, I'm no good at that. To do that, I would have to have a rule over death, over authority. I'd have to have authority over the grave. I would have to be able to speak life. Jesus is the only one who raised himself and others from the dead. He raised himself from the dead. That's a pretty good rule, isn't it? This is part of your story. You say, how could he do that? He had authority over death and the grave. He had rules. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I learned a lot about authority growing up. My daddy had and mama had seven kids. And I learned that if you didn't respect authority, there was a trip to the woodshed for you coming. Authority. Authority. But when it comes to this authority, this is when someone in authority says to something, this is the way it's going to be. And here's what Jesus did. Jesus had authority. He spoke to death and said, you will not be in control. He spoke to grave and said, you will not be sealed. He spoke to sin and said, you'll not have dominion over my people. I'm hamstrung when it comes to reviving a dead body. But the creator of the universe was not. And is not because he had what? Power, authority over death. You know what Jesus said in Matthew 28? All authority was that. All power and even this word, permission. All permission has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And the resurrection says, you proved it. You have authority. Now the cross was indeed a crisis. But the Roman soldiers really didn't have control over Jesus dying, did they? Jesus gave up his life because he had the authority to do so. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? He, he had the authority to lay down his life. Remember when the, when the soldiers came to break his legs to make sure he would die because, so he wouldn't get enough air in his lungs? That's what they did to criminals. They would still be alive. It was just torture. And they came to Jesus, and, and he was already dead. And so to make sure, they poked him with those spears and blood and water water. Ran out and they thought, wow, this is true. He's already passed. So they didn't break any bones. Why? So that prophecy could be fulfilled. But Jesus had already known what was coming. 
and he surrendered his life. By the way, the cross was his crisis and he overcame it. You may be in crisis yourself. God has the authority over every crisis in your life. Every crisis you might ever face. Why? Because the proof of the resurrection of Christ says the authority over everything, including death, is in his hands. Do you believe that today? So what do you do with that truth? You walk confidently. Confidently. Through the worst of the crisis, you walk confidently. Why? Because you know that someone else has the power over your crisis. More than once... I have walked away from some crisis with my head down thinking, man, I'm a loser. More than once, somebody's called me a loser. More than once, somebody's called me a failure. Until I grasp this truth that Christ has the power over all my crises. And I can walk confidently. I can walk with my head held high regardless of what my health is, regardless of what my future looks like. Regardless of the fact that I will not grow the extra 12 inches that I'd hoped to grow. <laughs> I will tell you this. We all have a redemption story. Your story is better than Tiger Woods. Tiger hired people to help him, didn't he? Yep. He had somebody to help him with his golf swing. He had good doctors. He even, he even hired a media consultant. Media consultant. If you think that it was just coincidental that his child came up and jumped in his arms and hugged him and it got put on national TV, why, I have some land in Florida, swamp land, to sell you. A media consultant made him look. Why? Because they wanted to talk about what? Tiger's redemption. But your story is so much better than Tiger Woods because your crisis was not a temporary one. Tiger's, believe it or not, Tiger's issues were temporary. His health. His marriage, that's all temporary stuff. Your story is better because you had an eternal crisis. And it was always in your face. No human consultant, no media consultant, no one on earth could help you make you look good again. You see, you were bound eternally for a life without Jesus Christ, without heaven, without hope. But when you accepted the claims of Christ, when you, when you said, when you bowed your head and when you bowed your heart and you humbled yourself and you say, Christ, I believe that you are God and that you died on the cross and you rose again. I believe that you have the power over sin and death. And I want you in my life, when you accepted the claims of Christ on your life, that the empty tomb proved. And you saw that Jesus had authority over the worst crisis imaginable. Your sin, your death. And your grave, you knew that your story was far better than any redemption story, including Tiger Woods. You see, true redemption is God at work. It was God at work. It still is God at work for your soul. It's his story in your story. But the empty grave has also given you abilities and power. You know, how, how many of you, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm always shocked when I ask this question. How many of you still read or watch Marvel, you, Marvel comics, and you go to the theaters when there's superheroes on? And now, adults, come on now. Come, come. God help all these people for lying today in church. <laughs> how many of you go see Star Wars when a new one comes out? Now it's getting a little better here. It's a little better. We, we think about all the powers and abilities, don't we? Yeah. And we go to watch that stuff because it, it fuels us. But did you know that you have abilities and powers that you know you did not have before you were redeemed? You see, your story is about a, a doing the impossible, about achieving dreams. I want you to listen very carefully. We achieve more in our new life because of the empty tomb. Now remember, you have to have had accepted the claims of Christ. Before this works. But after the resurrection and just before Jesus left the world to ascend into his Father in heaven, he said this to his followers and to us. But you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The end of the earth? Now, Jesus never made it to Spain, did he? He never made it to London. Is this what I think it is? 
Do you know what the word power there means? Achieving power. Because Jesus arose from the dead, because he defeated death, hell, and the grave, because he carried your sin and mind away as he shed his blood, you and I can achieve more than we ever dreamed possible. I was watching one of our converts, um, one of the Lord's converts that got saved in this church some years ago. And I was watching her and looking at her face as I talked to her. And, and my mind went back to the day when, that night really, uh, when she accepted Jesus Christ. And, and um, she was saved from a, a, a life of drugs and drama. And I'm telling you, she's achieved more in this life than I ever imagined possible. But I know what she would have achieved without Jesus Christ. She would have achieved addiction, death, pain for her family. And some of, some of you right now are thinking that the life you are living without Jesus is just right for you. And you will achieve something in that life. But I can promise you, it's more than you can imagine more than you can even think of doing, your life is going to be so much more with the resurrected Savior controlling it. You can achieve every dream that God gives you. There's 12 guys. They walked with the Savior. They saw the Savior after his death and after his resurrection. He ate with them just to prove that he was alive and well. And you know what? They went out and achieved, achieved the impossible. Literally today, right here in Monkey Junction in Myrtle Grove, you and I have the gospel given to us because of 12 guys who achieved more than they could ever dream as fishermen and as tax collectors. And You can achieve more. Now, I don't want to overdo the tiger redemption angle, but no one including Tiger, thought he would ever win another major. Can I get a witness? In fact, most of us were hoping he would never win another major. A few of people got that. But here's the deal. His body was racked with pain. His reputation was in the toilet. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not a big Tiger fan. Um, his arrogance uh, kind of throws me off a little bit. But one thing I know, with some help from the doctors and lawyers and friends... Tiger achieved something special, and this time on a big stage. I love this. I, I love earthly redemption stories. I, I love to hear them. Even if I don't like the person, I still love to hear the story. But more than that, I love to hear your story about how you accepted the claims of Christ, and then you look at your life now and say, where would I have been had it not been for Jesus Christ? You see, this is your story. I have personally known and experienced the redemption of Jesus Christ. He took me from error and he set my feet on a new pathway. And I look out this congregation today and I see you and I see some of your stories and I remember them. And I see that you've achieved much since the resurrection redemption story in your life. You know, that's what Jesus had in mind. You ever think about what Jesus has on his mind? You know, I, there's an old song. I was, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind, and I know there's a lot of hullabaloo about that song sometimes with theologians, but here's the reality. He had this in mind when he arose from the dead. You see, Easter assures you of a power. A power for what? An authority and a power to be a good dad, a good mom. It, it gives you the power and authority to, and the ability to achieve a good being, a good role model, a faithful worker for the Lord, and so, 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 so much more. The resurrection opens doors for you to do great things in your life. Yours is a story of redemption. Yours is a story of redemption. Yours is a story of when God bought you back. I leave you today with one last passage from one guy who thought his story was over when Jesus was crucified. I want you to hear the voice of an aged apostle named Simon Peter, the one who denied Jesus. 
In his little letter, he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's pretty confident words, isn't it? Confident words for somebody who was a spiritual failure. And let me say this. Your story of redemption, remember, it's all about you living and walking in confidence, having a confident life. And some of you think that maybe you're a spiritual failure. And some of you haven't been to church for a while. And some of you have had issues in your homes and so forth. And you just feel like I'm a failure. I'm just such a failure. Spiritually before God, God doesn't want me. I'm a failure. But I'm here to tell you that if Peter, who denied the Lord, can achieve something and walk with confidence and then say, He is my hope, because he rose again, so can you. Your story of redemption is all about living in confidence. Now back to the story of the empty tomb. Mary, John, Peter, they come and find the tomb empty. And then they begin to spread the news. Jesus begins to reveal himself to everyone that he's alive. And the resurrection is the one undisputed reality in the world with evidence galore. Can I get a witness? People have tried to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. No one has been successful. Those who loved him spread the word. Jesus is alive. What happened after that? Remember, those guys went out, confidently shared the good news. It was like they were going around saying, he beat death. He beat the grave. He beat the cross. Who cares about any other leader? We can follow him to the death because he beat it. And he'll beat it for me. And your story came from their witness and their story. And they literally spread the good news around the world. Like Peter, are you confident in Jesus today? Do you have hope beyond this life? Does your story reveal to others that he is the risen Savior? Would you stand with me, please? Today is a happy day. It is a day when we can sing, This is the day the Lord has made, and rejoice and be glad in it, because that psalm was written about the crucifixion. And I'm reminded today, I'm reminded that on this day, we of all people should be the most hopeful, the most blessed. And I just wonder today if somebody here is not filled with hope because you have never accepted the claims of Christ. Heads bowed and eyes closed. This is a good day to celebrate. It's a good day for you to tell your story if you have been redeemed by the precious blood of the cross and by the empty tomb. His empty tomb is saying to all of us today, new life with a great hope. That's what you have. New life, great hope. Father, over these, your people, I pray today that they will see an open grave, an empty tomb, that the claims of Christ authenticate or are authenticated by everything that was done on that Easter Sunday morning so many years ago. And we still celebrate that life, that new life today. Creating us a hope beyond the grave. And I pray for those who are suffering right now and are not sure of how they're going to be able to make it through this week. And I pray that they would just walk confidently through their crisis. That their graves, that the world would put them in and secure them in, that they would be opened because of the risen Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Be seated, please.
the place where Jesus was laid for the sins of the world the lamb had been slain at Calvary death declared its final amen all creation trembled thinking this was the end See the light that's dawning on that third day. I can almost hear the Father say, Let the grave be open, let the stone be moved, let the glorious praises silence the tomb. There's a resurrection. Let the grave be open and let the world look in. Oh, yeah. There's a heart that's lost and alone. There's a soul in the night desperate for hope that Jesus sees and he's calling you to come and be free to simply let the grave clothes fall at your feet can you see the light that's dawning today is your day time to arise oh child let the grave be open, let the stone be moved, let the glorious praises silence the tomb. There's a resurrection for dead that once been. Let the grave be open and let the world look in. God's people said amen, amen, amen. Gentlemen, if you'd come, please. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Let me just say to you all that uh, we're happy you're here. But some of you um, may have struggled with something this morning. And uh, if you have, thank you, fellas. You're all bigger than I am. Keep moving. Keep moving. <laughs> keep, I'm struggling with them right there. If you're struggling with something this morning... I'll be down here to pray with you and talk to you. Our deacons will be here to talk to you. And if you have a, a need on your heart and life, please don't hesitate to come and ask and say, can you please pray with me? Can you tell me about the claims of Christ? Can you share that with me? Because I wouldn't want you to leave here today and not be able to let the world look in on your life and see that you, are a, you, you live a life with an open tomb 
the resurrected Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the gift and the giver. As we take the offering of the morning, we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven. Spoke your name into the night, and through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ. Father, for the living hope that we have in you. Now bless these, your people, as we leave this place today, celebrating a risen Savior. In Jesus' holy name and for his sake we pray, all God's people said, amen.